David Hall, Legislative Council. Um, we're not starting it. We're not starting it. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm asking if uh, oh. if I can do the co-host and share my screen. Is that what you want, or do you want to? Yes. Do yes, please. So Ron will set that up. I've made him co-host, and the document he sent me went someplace. So I'm going to have to do it again. So. Um, All right, but he can share. He can share that document from his screen. Yes. So I will. All right. Uh, well. Welcome everybody, it's Tuesday morning. Um, we are uh, the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee of the Vermont General Assembly. We are here today to continue talking about uh, this COVID-19 recovery bill as it relates to housing, specifically housing uh, the homeless individuals, the individual, the families and, and households that have been experiencing homelessness in Vermont, specifically since the um, advent of this emergency, which was the middle of March um, for our edification. Basically, we housed up to 2,000 um, Vermonters, including approximately 300 children, into motels across and some and some shelters across the state. And these this recovery package is very much part of the next steps. Um, we've talked about this a lot over the last month or so, and um, in and we just did a, a carve out of some of the money that's been allocated toward housing from the COVID funds. Um, these are proposals that were being put together by the General Assembly uh, of twenty three million dollars. We agreed last week to uh, carve out $23 million to go to VHCB and include that language in an amendment that was um, presented on the floor today in the Senate. And I believe they passed their, their fast track bill. Um, so we should be seeing that relatively soon over the next couple of days, depending on how fast the process works with them. Um, I will echo um, something that I had heard from Senator Sorokin over the weekend is just that this is, you know, I, I just want to spend a moment and reflect on how long we usually spend on legislation. This is a lot faster than we ever do. And we're, we're here trying to alleviate a problem that we think is the right thing to do, which is to get Vermonters into homes, um, especially during a public safety and public health crisis like this. Um, you can't be safe at home if you don't have a home to go to. So this is a, um, David Hall has put together this um, it's a fairly bare bones structure of, of allocations or appropriations that we are, that we would suggest. It is, a, he's using numbers that I provided to him that we've heard from advocates, but they are, I would consider them in draft form. These are a little bit lower than we may have heard from advocates because um, I split these into tier one and tier two um, expenditures. Tier two, if you remember, is uh, proposed to come later on in the summer if um, the General Assembly is, is withholding expenditure of 400 million in order to see if it can be spent on purposes that are not currently allowed. And if in between now and sometime in the summer that those, it's clear that those are, those purposes are not going to be allowed, then um, the expenditure of that money would default to what we put forward in, in, in our case in this tier two spending proposals that, that I shared with you this morning. So um, with that, David, I'm gonna pass you the microphone and I would just ask if people have, including, um, including some of the, the guests that are here, but you know, if you have a comment, um, please let me know either by raising your hand or sending me a note and I will try to get to those concerns as they, as they are um, developing in, in front of us. But we have, a lot of, we have a lot of stuff to go through. It's only a two page bill right now. So in two pages, we're gonna spend $50 million and um, on this, but before before I pass the microphone over, I will go to Representative Hango. Thank you. Can we see this on the website now, Ron? Ron, did you catch that? Yes, I was trying to get over to my screen. Yes, okay. it's been posted and is visible. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, David, please go ahead. Sure. So good morning uh, to all of you, David Hall, Legislative Council. Um, glad to be able to be with you. Um, I 
uh, have been quite uh, busy with economic development stuff as well. So I apologize that I'm not always able to join you when you're having your discussions. It's um, definitely an unusual time uh, for everyone. Uh, just so you're aware this morning, the Senate Economic Development Committee made its report to the Senate on uh, $70 million of economic development grants and then your $23 million proposal to VHCB and others for emergency housing assistance that was uh, amendment was adopted. So it is on third reading and should pass tomorrow, I believe. Um, and you'll see it from uh, the Senate. Um, on this uh, bill you have in front of you, as the chair indicated right now, this is basically a framework. It's a skeleton um, of what your proposals are for uh, this this sort of major tier one round of housing COVID dollars. And I, before I turn to language, I just want to talk much bigger picture with you for a moment. So uh, myself, my colleagues, we are all working on, or most of us are working on uh, something similar right now in committees of jurisdiction um, and you know, as you're probably aware, different pots of money have been allocated to different uh, subject areas for expenditure. And all of this will be pulled together, in my understanding, in, in, into one bill for the coronavirus relief fund expenditures. Um, within our office and working with JFO, we have adopted sort of, uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of a proposal for the committees, I believe the appropriations committees ultimately uh, for language that sort of governs the whole spectrum of grants and programs that are funded through coronavirus relief fund. And those sort of stock provisions will govern things like um, conditions for grants and the, the necessity of the expenditure, the requirement that recipients and also administering AG agencies adopt procedures and keep and maintain records to ensure compliance with the CARES Act. Um, what happens if you have to authorize temporary positions? What happens if you have to do an RFP and whether that's gonna be subject to underlying laws about competitive bidding? The answer is no. Um, things for committees to consider as far as uh, you know, eligibility to the extent it's necessary, um, reporting requirements, all the usual things that you, you know, would think would go along with the expenditure of money. These provisions, the aim is to treat at least those components of this fund uh, as identically as possible. So there is one standard across the board for how long you have to maintain records, et cetera. So what's specific to your work and to the other committees, of course, is how you are proposing to spend your allotment of the money. And uh, I, I wanna stay big picture here for a moment and talk about the scope of what these uh, proposals are, can be, should be, et cetera. The first governing principle is there's no right or wrong way to do this, right? If you think of, um, spending a lot of money to get money out the door through some process, there is a continuum. And on the, on the most general end of the continuum, it is just an appropriation. It's a one line appropriation that says, you know, in, in, how we normally do it in fiscal year 21, the amount of X is appropriated from to for the purpose of, and that's it. And, um, you know, that obviously relies on the recipient of that money to uh, execute the program. And whether it's through the adoption of rules or guidelines or programs and procedures, processes, however you want to structure it, it's a very deferential uh, approach to spending money. And frankly, that is what the economic development bill and the housing bill that's just adopted this morning does. It says, that the Department of Taxes and the Agency of Commerce are gonna come up with 
the process through guidelines and get this money out the door. And, and it's not much more than that. And, uh, you know, for people like you and me who are used to spending a lot of time on periods and commas and particular words, that can be uncomfortable. I understand that. And it's just a balance, um, obviously, that you have to make as policymakers. On the other end of that spectrum, of course, is, you know, uh, a very prescriptive program design uh, with all the details about how many days until this has to happen and days till that has to happen and who does what and what the criteria are and what uses are eligible and uses are ineligible and you know you can define it uh, to death and beyond and that's the the far other end of the spectrum and then you know of course I'd, I'd say the usual practice is to land somewhere in the middle where the general assembly does its due diligence and work to iron out tons and tons of details through long committee process and then leave some discretion, of course, to the executive branch to execute the laws, which is its job. So um, no one way is right or wrong. Uh, all have been used in the past, I would say, in the context of the coronavirus relief fund. Most people are erring on the side of deference to the administration because that is what's necessary to get the money out the door. And they have a great deal of flexibility. And with that comes a great deal of responsibility as well, of course. So with all that said and preface, let me just turn to the language here. You know, essentially this is a list of appropriations from the Coronavirus Relief Fund and you'll see in line 12 that all of the money actually goes to the Department of Housing and Community Development to provide funding to housing partners and service providers for the purposes specified. I've written it that way right now, and that's not the only way it has to be, but right now I've written it that way for two reasons. First, so that uh, it, it's less complicated to just give the money to GHCD and then um, you know, sort out exactly who gets what right now. Uh, se second, it allows them, the, the department, to administer funds in the normal way, which, was, which is basically through subgrants that come with grant agreements, gives them some measure of control and responsibility for the payment of funds and to ensure that the recipients comply with all the requirements related to the CARES Act and whatever else goes along with uh, the administration of grants through various administrative bulletins that the executive branch has. Um, and, you know, and, and third, uh, again, it allows the department to design the process, the eligibility criteria for recipients and for uses, et cetera, that will be used when ultimately the, the rubber hits the road. So with that, we go to the categories, basically one, legal services, $550,000 to provide legal and counseling services to persons who are or at risk of experiencing homelessness or who have suffered economic harm due to the COVID-19 crisis. Obviously, the overarching uh, rule governing this bill and this expenditure of funds is that it has to comply with the CARES Act. So remember that these expenditures have to be determined to be necessary by the state. They have to be due to the public health emergency. They have to be incurred between March and end of December, and they cannot have been budgeted for in the most recent budget adopted by the state. Other than that, um, you know, we can use CARES Act funds to administer programs in response to the crisis and for the cost generally of administer, administering those programs. So that's why it says, you know, harm due to COVID-19 crisis. Subdivision two here, shelter rehabilitation, $9 million for the rehabilitation of homeless shelters to achieve compliance with guidance of the Centers for Disease Control and to ensure public health. Under three here, foreclosure protection, $5 million to provide assistance to persons who are or at risk of foreclosure due to the COVID-19 crisis. Four is rental assistance and eviction protection. That's 
thirty million dollars to provide rental assistance to persons who have suffered economic harm due to the COVID nineteen crisis, including for rental arrearages incurred since April first, twenty twenty, and for security deposits and expenses to secure new rental housing. Um, number five, capital expenses, two million dollars, or I, I'm not sure yet. Um, I think we need to fill in some blanks here. I have some questions about how that money might be used. And yeah, off the top of the, that was kind of the the balance of the 25 million we originally, not right. originally, but that we had come to for VHCB capital expenses, and then we cut 23 million out for the fast track. So that would right. that, that was the original thought of that figure. Right. And then six rehousing investments, five million dollars to assist landlords with the cost of renovations necessary to provide housing to persons who are or are at risk of experience homelessness or require rehousing due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and it's effective on passage. So that's sort of the framework, um, you know, and from here, I, I suppose it's time to discuss uh, whatever questions you have and what direction you want to go. And just as a reminder to the committee, this was this was considered tier one spending. So the numbers are, are lower than they were um, in some of the recommendations from the advocates. So for instance, um, we heard as late as last week that $10 million to $12 million might be appropriate for shelter expenditures. Um, that 42 to 45 million dollars might be appropriate for rental assistance and arrearages and the reason that that i split them like this over over the course of um was that was that there was two tiers and so getting this up and running standing up these these grant proposals standing up these um, ways of getting money to um, Vermonters will a will take some time, and b be, you know in terms of things like rental assistance or foreclosure assistance, um, I think that there's a thought in general that if the people who have been unemployed are the most likely to need this, and they've been receiving six hundred extra dollars a week on top of their unemployment, that there's a real you know, there, there hasn't been an indication yet of a real run on, on any of these issues yet, but there will be in time, in, in time to come. And so that's why the money was split. So you're going to see when, um, I believe I shared a tier two document that, that we can, that we can um, put up on the, put up on the website that, um, so if it says $30 million for rental assistance, in tier two, there's another $15 million expenditure because that would take care of what would be happening in the summer and the fall. Um, so we have two questions, three questions lined up right now. Um, Representative Kalaki and then Triano. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for this great work here. Um, David, I have a question regarding uh, number four with the rental assistance and eviction protection. Um, I wanna make sure I, I think it's in here, but this is not just for people who are housed. This is also for people who are homeless so they can apply for security deposits and expenses to secure new rental housing. Is that correct? I, yes. Okay. I mean, that's my understanding is this is both for people who are in rental situations and they have back rent that's due right right and, and then also for um, people who uh, either don't have housing and need to acquire it or people who for some covid related reason need to change housing okay so because I, I, I think there's perfect. a lot of flexibility there it's definitely uh retrospective and prospective okay and then the second part of that my question and um is that for instance, in my district is a women's prison and 58 women have now been released from the prison really because of the whole COVID uh, crisis, but they were not given support to come out of prison. And so could Department of Corre people leaving the Department of Corrections, could they also then apply for security deposits and expenses to secure new rental housing and under the way it's phrased? I think they certainly could apply 
Um, okay. Let me just be clear that, again, if we're on the deferential side of the end of the spectrum here, what would happen in real life is that $30 million will move from the coronavirus relief fund to the Department of Housing. And the Department of Housing will look at this and say, we have $30 million to provide rental assistance for back rent and for people who need security deposits or other expenses to get into new rental housing. To whom they give that, how they give that, how they apportion the money between those two populations, all of that is left to the discretion of the executive branch to execute. So I can't tell you that those people or any people would get any particular kind of assistance or what amount, because I don't know. But at some point, you know, the Department of Housing would have to figure that out. And whether they do that directly or whether they do that with partners and subgrants. I don't know. They have the discretion to do that. I mean, the, the governing principle here is that $30 million has to be spent for these purposes, and, they, and it has to comply with the CARES Act and the guidance and the FAQs. So it, would it be too prescriptive to have a comma at the end of that sentence and saying, including the homeless and those leaving I don't know how to say it appropriately that those leaving the correctional facilities. Or I mean, that... from a drafting perspective, you can put in a policy perspective, of course, you can put whatever you want here. Um, you know, I, you, you, uh, there's, there's different constructs. You can say including, which means including, but not limited to A, B, C, D, E, and F. Or you could say, which may include, doesn't necessarily have to. Um, I mean, it, again, this is the this is the conversation right. as, as policymakers. How how far down the prescription rabbit hole do you want to go? Okay, well, I, those are my uh, so currently those two populations are eligible. So I'm I'm good with that. So I just wanted to make sure I understood. Yes, I, okay. I think definitely eligible. Thank you. Representative Trano. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure whether this would go to David or, or to you, uh, Tom. Um, what is, well, for one thing, I wanted to mention in, in relation to what John is just, was just asking, I see Kimberly Jessup is on the phone and, and uh, on the online here. And um, I had a conversation with her last week about some funding that exists in the appropriation budget, I believe, um, that would um, be directed toward transitional housing away from for inmates that are being released from jail. So maybe we would briefly like to hear from her. But uh, my question is, what does the $9 million for um, a shelter renovation look like? Does anyone know how that will happen? I mean, will we be creating rooms in these shelters so that people can isolate some more and, the, and they're not living in close proximity to each other? Do we know how many shelters uh, around the state and what areas uh, will be covered by this $9 million? And I understand, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, that um, you have related to us that that could turn into considerably more money, but I'm just curious as to how that figure $9 million came about. The, um, the, yeah, the figure, the figure of $9 million came out is um, uh, Michael Monty from Champlain Housing Trust came here, and, I'll, and I, I'll pass the microphone to Chris Donnelly from Champlain Housing Trust, who's here as well. Um, they've identified in Chittenden County alone $5 million worth of, of upgrades that would be needed. I think, I think the, the question about, yes, they would, I mean, we, Good Samaritan Haven, for instance, in Barrie has, you know, bedrooms that have 10 or 12 people in them or could have 10 or 12 people in them. Those do not pass the CDC guidelines for social distancing. So this money would be spent to um, to really work on each of these these um, shelters across the state. Michael estimated, you know, $10 million or so, or, you know, could be, you know, he knows 5 million for, for Chittenden County. But let me pass this over to Chris Donnelly for, for an answer on from, from the Champlain Housing Trust perspective. 
Okay, Chris, Chris, if you're there. Yes, yes th thank you, um, Chair Stevens, and for the record, it's Chris Donnelly with the Champlain Housing Trust. Um, you are correct. We've uh, done an assessment here for about $5 million in Chittenden County. I've had some conversations with uh, some shelter providers around the state, and they're not ready to um, to take people when the weather starts getting colder and when people start coming out of the motels. So I do think that there needs to be a quick assessment of the needs, but if it's 5 million in, in this, this part of the state, then we think it's gonna be probably at least double that. Most of these funds in the past, and, and perhaps Gus Seeley can talk um, to this, um, VHCB has supported the capital needs of shelters throughout their history. And so it would make sense that you know, these, these dollars get consolidated in one place so that we are making decisions in the most appropriate way. And Gus, do you want to chime in? I can't see you from where I am on my screen right now, but. Um... Um, we agree with Chris that there is a need. We, have, we will begin in earnest and we're about to issue a letter of interest uh, both for the funds uh, that you are fast tracking, uh, as well as this to, to just to begin to get our hands around what the need is statewide. Um, I think it would probably, I would probably suggest that you make the language a little broader because we just don't know how much will be shelter rehab and how much will be other kinds of rehab, but we certainly understand the need to um, address the shelter situation. We just got a note from a letter that I think you passed on um, from pretty much the whole Franklin County delegation asking for help for the shelter up there. Um, so we will certainly have that at the top of our list of things that we are trying to get our hands around. I would say to you that uh, as you just indicated, Mr. Chairman, uh, whatever fixes we make to a, good, the good, a place like the Good Samaritan Haven, they will have a smaller capacity in the future uh, than they have currently. Uh, they cannot continue the, to um, house as many as the 30 or 40 people in that facility as they were once housing. Um, so uh, how much it will make sense to invest in that particular facility as opposed to others to make them CDC compliant and how much people can get this work done by December 30th, we still have to figure out. All right, I'll set Chip. Uh, yeah, for now, that's good, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Representative Hango, then Walls. I had another comment that I wanted to make, but I just want to follow up on what Mr. Seelig just said about Samaritan House. That's a little concerning to me because it is the only shelter in Franklin County, to my knowledge, and to not invest in that would be rather disastrous. Um, so I'm wondering if you're foreseeing that broader language being shelter rehab and or um, rehab of other types of units to be used on a temporary basis. Is that what I'm, I'm hoping I'm hearing? Yes, I, I, my, there's absolutely the letter, you're, the letter you and your colleagues have sent makes clear that something needs to happen there. And we just would like to make sure that investing in any particular facility, and I was actually talking about the Good Samaritan Haven, not Samaritan House, Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> to, just to clear up any confusion, I have not been in the Samaritan House, and I just don't know, and my staff has not in many years, how much to invest there or how much to help them buy an additional building. Um, and that, that's why we just want to have enough flexibility that we're not limited only to fixing facilities that will still be inadequate if what they need is to buy another building. Okay, so thank you. I thank you for that. I, I missed the Haven part of that. Um, so I think definitely broadening the language to allow for creative uses of that funding um, in whatever way a regional organization um, deems 
the best solution to their individual unique problems. I think that's the best way to go. So I definitely would be supportive of a little bit broader language um, to include other types of dwelling units other than shelters in that $9 million. Um, my other concern that I was going to bring up before that is in regards to section four with the rental assistance, I've talked at length about um, supporting landlords. And I know that this money can be used towards, uh, to go directly towards landlords. However, I'm a little bit reluctant to be very specific about it, but um, I do feel it's very important to name landlords as recipients of these funds if appropriate. Um, in terms of rental arrearages and um, even subsidies, et cetera, to keep landlords whole. So I think I'll stop there and uh, pass it along. Thank you. All right, um, Representative Walls, then Byron. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Representative Torano asked my original question, but I, I'd like to expand on it a little bit and what, and what Gus uh, comment made about uh, Good Samaritan Haven and Barry, uh, that would be quite difficult to rehab according to distancing procedures. And if we did do it, obviously it would cut down considerably on the capacity. And so that's something I think I'm not sure we, we've got a good enough handle on is what our total capacity is going to be here. And I'm thinking now when we get into cold weather, and we get into the overflow shelters in the churches, for example, you know that they're not going to meet the distancing standards. And so I don't know if we need language in the bill about this, but I think we really need to look at the expansion of capacity. And I guess that's kind of a balancing of rehabbing the shelters, creating more uh, rehabbing uh, apartments and houses. Uh, especially for the homeless. But I, I, I think there's got to be a target number. Maybe that's the way to put it. And I would caution the, all of us to, to consider that, uh, to make sure that we are, we've, we're trying to get as many of the homeless as possible. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, Representative Wells, I think that's 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 true. And uh, you know, the goal is to lessen the reliance on shelters. What we've seen over the last however many years is that with the, the with the economic downturn affecting people at that level, at that economic level, where people are so precariously housed that the, uh, the numbers have grown, and the use of the shelters that we've taken testimony for the last several years about how much the use of the shelters has grown. And, and, and they're used for a longer period of time. And, you know, hopefully, I think the goal here is that if we can provide that other housing to get, you know, to create the spaces within the shelters that are appropriate for CDC compliant, that we take, you know, that it doesn't, it won't take care of itself. I was about to say that, and that's not, that's not the case at all. But I think that it would address what you're talking about. Like, what are the numbers of the people who will absolutely choose to be in a shelter um, under the worst possible case scenario. Um, Representative Byron. Thank you. Um, my question is around sort of the like timeline on the, the work and scope of this. Um, was the, the number calculated with the uh, help of contractor estimates or input from them? And the, just the, the period of time for the scope of work it has me curious. And I'll pass that to Rep, uh, to Gus Seelig. I think that that's going to vary from um, one region of the state to another and will also depend upon the relationship that a facility may have with both maintenance staff and contractors. Um, as we've been surveying people um, across the state, we know that a certain amount people believe can be done by December 30th. Um, and then there's more work that may not get done until then. And we know we will then have to use state funds or some other source um, to finish work that can't be done. So, but we have not done the, the full kind of surveying, particularly of the shelters that we've done in looking to stand up other facilities around the state. 
And that's really going to be our next step. And it starts with issuing a letter of interest to all the providers, asking them what kinds of projects they want to undertake and what they think they can get done by December 30th. So we're gathering that information as quickly as we can now, but we don't have it at our fingertips. Okay, thank you. So David, a quick question for you. Well, it's not gonna, I'm sorry, it's not gonna be a quick question, but it, the, so the idea of saying that we're going to uh, grant this money to the Department of Housing and Community Development, who then under their normal course of grant processes are going to receive applications for this, um, for these funds from, from the agencies that we like VHCB in particular, uh, that would be responsible for um, further disseminating the money, distributing the money or the services that we're, that we're talking about. Um, where does where does being prescriptive fit in? Um, for instance, for instance, if we wanted to say this, following up on what Representative Kalaki was saying, that if we wanted to say that this rental assistance money you know, must include this, 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 and this, and and that this process must include this, 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 and and this, where is 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 that is that something that we should be doing here? Um, being that prescriptive or is this something that happens within the normal grant process that the grant you know the grant says you know that 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 this money is for that i mean do we have to tell the department of housing who this money is for or do we is it better for us to leave it a little bit more general and let the parties negotiate the different you know the the, the um the prescriptive nature of what the money goes to further than what we say here I mean, again, there is no right or wrong way to do it, and there's precedent for always. I mean, you can, I'm sure you can all think of, uh, you know, grant programs. I, I, I don't know if any of you have ever had the pleasure of filing an application for a historic barn preservation grant, uh, but I have working with my uh, in-laws and their dairy farm. And it's a, it's a very lengthy process. And the, the, the administering department has a healthy application that requires all kinds of information um, that takes a while to put together. And then they have their criteria and then they make their decision. The statute that authorizes that program is not nearly as detailed, obviously, as, um, as, as you know, the, the criteria and the guidelines for actually applying for and receiving the grants. So that's normal, uh, it, but it's also normal because I'm sure you've all read the budget that sometimes, you know, you get as deep down into the weeds as you can imagine and say, there will be five grants for this much money for this or that. And sometimes, sometimes appropriating legislation specifies that it's a pass-through. So the money will go to the department to be granted to this entity for these three things. And so I, I can't tell you that one's better than the other. It's a, just a policy choice uh, for you to make, but I guess the factors that you need to weigh are um, sort of the, uh, how, how, what are the, you know, how much of the minimums or how many boxes do you want to force them to check here in this legislation versus how much discretion are you going to give them to expert, uh, exercise their expertise in, um, in implementing a program? I guess I'll, I'll say by analogy, think of what we call at this point the administrative state, right? And so many agencies and departments since the 1930s, both the federal and the state levels have been created to implement authorizing legislation. And you have things like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, which set sort of the minimum standards, but then gives money over to subject matter experts like scientists to decide how many parts per million of this particular chemical can go into this particular body of water. And then you have um, more prescriptive legislation that tries to lay out the whole framework in statute. The benefits and costs are, are a balancing act. How much flexibility and discretion and timing 
do you need to preserve in the legislation? How much do you need to delegate to the executive branch to execute the law? And so those are just, those are balanced questions that I, there's no right or wrong answer. It's one, but they're questions that you have to answer. Okay. Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Chair. I, I thought Josh ha was going to send us what the um, administration uses for language. So it's not an open-ended RFP for these things, but it would be, they kind of frame it. So it's 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 clear while, while we don't say um, for the, the legal stuff, we, we don't say the organization, but it would be clear that there's only one organization and that is right for. So we don't yeah. name them. And we I think, I think I did receive that, um, John, and I can just share that with, um, I'll send it to Ron to post it. Okay. Um, I think I received that late last night. Let me just go through my emails and um, send that around. He did, he did send something. Um, so we'll try to get that posted in the next few minutes. Um, it just might give guidance to the agency um, about what are the appropriate organizations without naming them. But yep. we'll see. It might not. Thank you. Okay. Um, Representative Triano. Yes, thank you. Um, David, I have applied for a bond grant and you're right. It took me two tries actually. But, uh, but um, so when you mentioned um, uh, the um, uh, conservation housing, uh, uh, the um, Department of uh, Housing and Community Development, um, Administering the grant does that will that include um, identifying whether or not expenditures are are compliant with the COVID relief money? Absolutely, yes, okay. and and also as I said uh, at the top of the meeting, there um, there there will be sort of across the board provisions that apply to all of this money as far as record keeping and compliance with the act and the guidance uh, imposed both on the administering authority and on the recipient. So um, all of that will be baked into the larger bill. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, next up I have Representative Hango. Thank you. I have a couple of questions just for clarity and a comment. My comment is that I would really prefer this to be a broad and balanced bill, um, particularly because it's this language is going out tomorrow at noon. Is that correct? That's our deadline for this? Well, that's to get it to the next committee. Yeah. Right. So I feel like um, narrowing it at this point, we all have special interests that we'd like to see taken care of, but narrowing it down is gonna take up a lot of time. Um, so that's my comment. My question, another question um, is the ACCD bill language that you sent us, Mr. Chair, um, does that address the question that Representative Kalaki had about various agencies being named no, I just actually found um, Commissioner Hanford's email from, uh, like, sh anyway, it should just be in your email box. It was from a day okay. ago. And okay. it has um, language that says along the lines of the program shall be administered in partnership with a Vermont based statewide organization with expertise in partnering with private landlords, nonprofits and other statewide agencies, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's written pretty, um, it's pretty, tight towards which administrator um, it would be geared toward. And there's one in there for the foreclosure information and, and Ron and Ron mentions that they are both posted and visible now. So. Um, okay, thank you for that. Because you did send us another document earlier today towards the end of the house floor session um, that was listed as ACCD bill. Which yeah, and that was that was legal aid's proposal for um, some uh, prescriptive language about how the program would be in in session law because that's what we're working with is um, is how the program would be would be administered. 
Okay. So it's that was from VLA because um, there was no designation who it came from. So, yeah. okay. Um, and I just want to be extremely clear that this this wording that we're sending out by tomorrow at noon or later today or whenever we send it is strictly for tier one funds. And that's approximately 75 million minus the 23 million that we already talked about. Yeah, I think the processes would, would, would also apply to the tier two money. Um, and there's also a question that I have for David uh, when we talk about, because the other, the other thing that I do want to spend some time talking about in a little bit is the, the enhanced fee hit money which is to, uh, because there's some issues with that that I really want to make sure that we shine a light on and really think about because uh, in coordination with uh, this question that I'm going to have for David right now, which is, is there in the general fund, the, the general writing of this bill, this idea of flexibility? We, we heard from Commissioner Hanford, for instance, last week that said, well, you know, if we don't spend money here, or if we find that there's not as much uptick there, that we might be able to shift funds over for another use. And is that part of the, um, is that part of the larger bills language? Uh, I don't think so. Um, Cause that's in the ACCD, that's in the VLA proposal when it came to how to deal with, so there is some language about sharing or about not sharing, but about being flexible with some of this funding if it were available, if we couldn't use it someplace. So sort of those general, uh, app generally applicable sections governing all grants, to my knowledge, does not address that issue. Um, I don't think that by default, they can move money around from one pot to another. And, um, and the one piece, I guess, I would note about the stock language, the generally applicable language, is that it says, uh, basically, if the money is not spent, I believe the date they pegged was by December 20th, then it would revert to the coronavirus relief fund. Um, and then uh, I'm not certain, I believe the state would take a sort of last, you know, last 10 days default uh, allocation of whatever monies were unspent so that it didn't revert to the treasury. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. No, I'm just concerned that I'm just concerned that if we if we put in, um, so if we put in X amount of money for any of these line items, you know, you know, say, but talking about the enhanced fee hit program, and we yep. say we have five million dollars, and it turns out that it is undersubscribed, right? Then that money will be swept up on December twentieth. We don't we don't operate in a way that says. Oh look, there's three million dollars there. Let's take it and spend it on. Oh, we need this for rental assistance. Um, right. We don't. We don't have the freedom to do that. Uh, not by default. I mean, so obviously the General Assembly, just as a constitutional matter, has the authority to appropriate money and. When you say where it goes and what it's used for, even if it's general like this, that uh, circumscribes reallocation. I mean, there's there's one statutory provision that allows a limited amount of uh, reallocation of funds. I'd have to look it up, but it's not a lot. It's like fifty or seventy-five thousand dollars, something like that. It's it's certainly not. Uh, uh, a free ticket to take five million from rehousing and put it towards rental assistance. Those there's a lot of overlap there, so I don't know. Maybe maybe that's a bad example, but you know what I mean. If you're doing five million to prevent foreclosures, uh, so you know direct assistance to individuals to prevent foreclosure, you can't 
say, oh, we didn't use that. Let's let's repurpose that over in the uh, over in the rehab section and fix mm -hmm. up some rental housing. You would have to give specific authority to be able to move money around like that. I will note, though. I I mean I. So, for instance, the the economic development bill this morning, which includes in part your housing language, does call for weekly reports, and then another report on August fifteenth. So, I I have to assume also that uh, you will be apprised in a timely way before December twentieth whether or not the money is used. Okay, I'm just I mean, I, right, and I I mean because I. On one hand, um, there's a huge transparency issue. I don't want to like, I don't want it to be that we're going to say that this money is for X and then really, you know, spend it on L or P or something like that. And also, um, does, does this kind of funding, uh, if it's even this specific or, or this, this broadly specific, I suppose, um, come under the not with the, my, my least favorite thing about Vermont statute that says notwithstanding, um, anything that we say that we can use this money for any purpose that we determine and uh, that, that's how it's, how it's applied to the property transfer tax in particular, I mean, and other, and others funds too, but this is different money. That, that happens, that happens because there is a statutory formula that must be not withstood in order to do something else. I, I mean, really it's, we don't need to get into that, but there's a there's a there's a there's a statute that says here's gonna here's the breakdown of the property transfer tax and you know x percent goes here and y percent goes there z percent goes there, and so we have that notwithstanding language every year because otherwise that statutory formula would govern the distribution of those funds. That's not the case here. There's no there's no underlying statute that would govern the allocation of coronavirus relief funds. So whatever you say in this bill is going to be what that allocation is. And again, if, if you did want to give somebody the authority to move money around from one allocation to another, you would have to say it. And, and then you can put limits on that. You know, if, the funds in subdivision six are not used by December 15th for the purpose specified, the department may reallocate up to 10% or whatever is remaining or blah, blah, blah for X, Y, Z purpose or for any purpose. I mean, completely within your policy discretion on how you approach that. Okay, Representative Kalecki. David, I like the what you said about the, the Senate having a, not a weekly report. I think that's a, a little too much, but like an August report and then a December deadline. And, and I think it's just saying that the agency itself um, can, at, the, at those moments, reallocate the money as needed. Because in, in the middle of December, has, they have two weeks left to do it. So it's a little uh, hard. Excuse my phone behind me. Um, so could you, could you say what the Senate language was about the August bill, the August uh, report? It's essentially a, a final report on or before August 15th concerning the gui grant guidelines that the uh, agency and the department would adopt and the implementation of oh, the act. Okay. Yeah, that... I, uh, that, that, that that I I understand that now that wouldn't work uh, in this, but we could put in language of the December fifteenth that the agency has the authority to reallocate any unused dollars for the. Well, they, they'll have that. I think the. I mean, they is have it the a, agent. Is it the agency or is it the the administration? You know who who sweeps up the money to then try to spend it in the last ten days of the year. Again, well, I. I, my understanding, and I only have gathered this, I don't know if a final decision has been made, but the, the bottom line is if the money is not spent by December 30th, then it reverts to the U.S. Treasury. So I, I believe the, uh, the approach is that there will be a general provision in this larger bill that says 
the administering authorities have through December 20th to use the funds for the purposes specified. And if they are not, then those funds will revert back to Vermont's coronavirus relief fund. Okay. And at that point, there will be one or more sort of statute of, you know, act-based default uh, allocations that will happen more almost like the waterfall mechanism so that if we don't leave money on the table you know if people are not able to spend 400 or 1.25 billion dollars in time then there will be one or two or three places where that money will go out the door at the very end at the last minute to avoid just sending it back to the u.s government okay it, obviously it would have to be a, a a purpose that's in compliance with the CARES Act, and it's still CARES Act funds. Okay, thank you. Um, Ron, can you put up on the screen, um, or I'm sorry, David, do you have it? Do you have the tier two um, information I sent you, or should I have Ron put it up? Yeah, if you if you give me just one second, I can pull that up. Chair, we will come back to this bill, correct? Yes, this is all one bill. Because the, the, the thing about tier two is that we are going to have to put in, we, we've been asked to put in tier two language as well with the proviso, you know, I mean, that says in the event these funds are available, this second tranche of 400 million is available, that we are allocating the money to these for these purposes okay so that's something that we hadn't um we hadn't gotten to because we were focusing on what tier one was but to this this these elements here um are again this was just this is draft language if people have obviously ways to make this better i'm not this is this is how i was breaking it down um this weekend this this, this past weekend. And so you'll see $15.5 million in additional funding for, um, actually, David, if you can just scroll up, $15.5 million in additional funding for rental assistance, which would bring the total rental assistance, eviction protection, and the rearage program um, up to up to $45.5 million. Um, $3 million in additional funding for rehabilitation of homeless shelters, which would bring that up to 12 um, three million for the enhanced VIP if the need is reflected. Um, three million for foreclosure protection if a need is reflected. Five hundred thousand for the development of the registry, uh, and and then we get into this this twenty five million dollars. These last two figures, which are um, which are unknowns, but do we leave that out there and say, well, if if we get a ruling from the Treasury, from the federal delegation, from Joint Fiscal Council, from Legislative Council um, that says, oh, actually, we can use CRF money for the wraparound services that we've been talking about, including rental assistance um, or run rental other rental subsidies that would allow these projects to be financially viable over a two or three year period. So the numbers I just put in for placeholders was $15 million for the service components if ruled eligible. Um, the, the, the service components would be budgeted in the tier two side. And then that still left us short on our allocation. And we've been asked to also consider if in this case, um, there was a request from, excuse me, there's a low flying black helicopter, um, guard helicopter outside. Um, the, there's been requests, of course, from social services across the board, one of which is um, from the food bank or from Hunger Free Vermont. And this would be a, a potential allocation to provide food for people who were experiencing homelessness during the COVID crisis. Total placeholders, you know, in terms of what would be considered in August. Um, other committees seem to have more black and white um, tier two things. I, I'm looking at this as saying we're we're needing to see what the what the real world is in the first in that as we put that money out the first time to see if there's going to be 
um, a run on any of these services, which we think there's going to be. Um, so anyway, that's that's the tier two, that's the tier two proposal, which would get us up to 125, which fits our allocation. But again, we can we can lessen that allocation um, if we want, or we can shift money around to where we think it might be necessary. Representative Hango. Okay, hey, this is for clarification purposes. Will tier one and tier two be broken out in this bill draft request number 20? Or will they, will these numbers all be lumped together and we'll get it out the door that way? Uh, the, I originally thought it would be two separate things, but I've been asked by leadership to put it all into one. Um, proposal again with the pro with the proviso in there that, that says if funds are made available um, and they're eligible that this is where we this is where we want to see these allocations made and for us again they're much more of a continuation of of the proposals in tier one um, for the most part there's others you know the, the the issue of the registry obviously is is something that this committee didn't feel was a tier one priority but I would still like to see it in tier two. And obviously, the service components are um, the service components are ineligible right now. So, how do we differentiate that in in a bill? Because um, if this bill is going out as this is what we want, um, with the exception of the service components that we don't know are eligible, adding additional funds above and beyond what we thought was absolutely necessary at this point and adding in additional programs that could possibly uh, make it more difficult for this bill to pass and to get hands into Vermonters or to get funds into Vermonters hands sooner I, I really don't want to see any roadblocks in this. Um, I, I'm not sure why we're having to pass one bill with tier one plus tier two in it. Um, this is just, this is the way that the, um, the bill has been structured and the request from leadership has been structured. Um, this is something that, you know, the, so, so that's where that's that's why this is this is out there. We were asked to do tier one as our major priorities, um, and tier two as our as our subsidiary priorities and or continuations of the um, uh, of the programs that we put forth in tier one, which is why you see the split in the rental assistance and in the foreclosure and the rehab. Money but if the way, language way is if the language isn't going to be split like this, it won't be clear what our tier tier one and tier two priorities are. It's just going to be all. Oh, I, no, I think that there, I think that this is the prelude to this in the inside the bill would be to the extent that these funds are available, which addresses the fact that we as a general assembly are temporarily holding back $400 million from the, from the, um, 1.25 or what we're down to, uh, appropriation to because we're waiting to see if that money can be used for the general fund or the education fund or the transportation fund. There's $400 million that they're waiting to hear from the federal, as just as we're waiting to hear on the service component perspective, if that money can be used. If that money can be used for those purposes, if there's not another recovery act that comes through, if the HEROES Act is not passed and money does not flow in a way that, that we can use that money for those purposes and the CRF money is all of a sudden allowed to be used. Those that those purposes, those three purposes, those three specific purposes of the transportation fund, the education, the general fund, it is they're not allowed uses, they're not eligible uses of the CRF at this time. I if the if we hold if 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 the decision is made that we're not seeking these funds for that purpose, then that kind of opens the door to this expenditure. So we would be saying in the case that, in, you know, at the time that these funds become available for these uses, that this is how we would like to see that um, expended. But you told me in another breath that this, these 
particular items that are on the screen right now would not be broken out separately. Just the service components would be broken out separately and we would indicate if there was money that became available that was eligible for service components. So I still don't see how the rest of those numbers, if they're combined with the first numbers that David showed us on the original bill, how that's gonna to indicate to anybody reading this bill that we didn't originally want uh, $15.5 million plus 30 million. So $45.5 million for rental assistance. Anybody reading that bill would think that that's what we wanted to allocate right up front. So, uh, again, I think that I think that if if you heard me that way, I'm sorry. I yeah. think I was clear in saying that the tier two numbers that are put here fall under a different line. There's okay. a thick there's a thick line between tier one and tier two, and under that it will say, in the case that these funds are available for these purposes, this money will be expended in this way. Okay, thank you, because that's that's what I've been trying to get at all along. And without seeing it like in black and white written, I'm trying to envision it. So I must have misunderstood. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, two is next. Representative Zott. You kind of addressed um, what I was going to ask, except the as it's now being relabeled contingent appropriations is there any kind of ranking within those or is it just a giant sort of pot that's sitting there to be allocated in this way or maybe there will only be x amount available to be allocated that way and that x amount will be allocated and who decides that or is that a convoluted question or do you understand what i'm asking well it's a little bit of both, I think it's because this is pretty a convoluted conversation at times. Um, I did not put these in. I did not put these in order of priority um, on purpose. Um, there may be some priority simply by the way that it was typed, but the um, no, it's a good question because in the way that this process has been described to me is that if again if we're not in session and the joint fiscal committee is in charge of uh, ma you know, making the decision that those funds can be released for these purposes. Um, this, this, is, this represents like how we would spend what we've been allocated. And again, there's no priority that I've, I've weighted no priority. I've called this a draft. So how people would then spend it um, and who would be making that decision is a good question. Um, I think it would be, it would fall to the direction would be here in the statute and uh, the um, the actual uh, release of the funds would be part of the responsibility of, I mean, we, we are saying in the first half of this bill that this money is being granted to uh, or appropriated to the Department of Housing and community development from where they would then be issuing the grants to, to the other organizations. So um, my guess is that if this money is available and if all of the money is available, that it would be, um, that it would go to the Department of Housing and Community, it, the way that we have this bill prepared right now, um, it would be going to the Department of Housing and Community Development to then be regranted. Does, I, uh, that come, does that come close to answering your question? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It's, uh, it's you know, it's a little unsettling. Like again, I'm I'm weighing, uh, just like uh, uh, David Hall mentioned, like you know the expedite, you know, expediting the process and making sure we get the money out the door, but also wanting to have some kind of sense of what the priorities are. You know, so if I if I was in charge and I said, oh, do I want to spend three million on foreclosure protection? versus 3 million for enhanced VHIP, I'd rather do the foreclosure protection, but I don't know, you know, I don't know that we can micromanage all of that um, in this process. Well, and it kind of, it kind of, you know, what's interesting for me is that the phrase that came up for me while I was typing was if need is reflected, which is kind of a tricky phrase and it's probably not very legalistic, but it is, it, I think it addresses what you're, what you're concerned about is that, is that, 
is this an, I mean, it, another way to, that I can hear your question is, is this an automatic um, appropriation to a program that may not need it? Uh, yeah, although, right, the, the, the tricky part is who decides whether it's needed or not, obviously, right? <laughs> who decides if the need is reflected, if, it's, if, it, right. if, there's, yeah. if there's a shortage, if we see that there's going to be, you know, that, that by the time a decision has to be made that $28 million out of the original $30 million in rental assistance has been expended, well, somebody's going to say, well, if we spent that in three months, we're certainly going to, you know, let's give them the 15.5 and, and, and call them whole. The question then becomes, well, what if they need more? But that's separate from what you're asking. You know, that's, that's, um, so yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I, we're very, we're all very, um, curious as to, as to how that is going to work, um, come summertime. I'm sorry, but I also have a bigger concern about the, I, I kind of hinted at it before, but I'm a little concerned about this not being a fully holistic process. Like we're, we're operating particularly with the service components. We're making a decision that seems wholly predicated on CRF money. And I'm, and I'm wondering how do we advocate that says, even if we don't get the CRF money, we have to have a comp we have to have a commitment within the budget for these service cons components, irrespective of CRF. And again, if that means raising taxes on the top five percent of Vermonters in order to get that money, you know, for five years, let's do it and get the money. And it just feels a little ham. The process feels hamstrung to just say, well, we're only going to limit ourselves to the CRF money. And if not, we'll just sort of wipe our hands and say, well, we'll just figure it out down the road. I know that's not what anybody in this committee is necessarily saying, but it kind of feels like it in a process fashion. Um, I, I agree. I think that, um, you know, it, if the focus, because of the limitations of the CRF money, if the focus is on capital expenditures, let's just say on fixing shelters and creating at least 200 plus units through through the appropriations, you know, the $23 million fast track and $2 million elsewhere is um, we've heard plenty of testimony that said, well, this isn't really going to be sustainable if the third leg, the service, you know, the wraparound services and, and, and the second leg, which is the rental subsidies, no one's promising that that's gonna happen. I think everybody I've talked to acknowledges that that is necessary and is going to, um, is going to make the conversations that we have with the appropriations committee starting the summer um, there, we're going to have to, we're going to have to um, make sure that there is follow-up services because we're not, we're not promising it with the CRF money. And it makes all of these projects a little bit shakier. Um, I, they can get done. I have no question about that, but that, that the sustainability, I think, you know, is a big question for all of us to answer, um, both, both in the legislature and, and the administration. So, um, what's next folks? Um, do you want to see the language that Josh Hanford shared with us? Does that make sense next? Because yes. the, the uh, because the the um, and actually, uh, I'd like to kind of uh, toss the microphone over to Jeffrey Pippinger from AHS, who's here today, um, listening in just to just to um, kind of address what um, Representative Zott was was asking. The microphone is yours, sure. Jeffrey. For the record, Jeffrey Puppinger, Senior Advisor to the Commissioner for the Department for Children and Families. Um, <clears throat> I think this is something that we've been focused on within the agency, uh, understanding that the agency's role in developing a housing plan is really about trying to provide the services that can support the uh, bricks and mortar that are coming from other proposals. So we've been working internally to figure out what types of support we're going to be able to offer to uh, households going forward, the households and motels, and I think that we'll be uh, able to present something shortly regarding that. Uh, but it's uh, our thoughts have really been around uh, how do we, to um, the point made, how do we ensure that there are services and that there's uh, housing navigation 
and the assistance needed to make sure that uh, households are going to be successfully rehoused and stay in housing. All right. Thank you, Jeffrey. Representative Hango. Thank you. I just um, really will need clarity on, I understand there are two different parts of money, pots of money that we're talking about. One of them is to rehouse individuals or families, and the other is the ongoing services to keep them in that housing. So I really need to know what AHS is thinking about in terms of keeping those people in homes, because in my in my short time on the housing committee, I feel like we're the housing people. We need to get people into housing, but I feel like human services should be the organization that keeps people in that housing. And maybe I'm, I'm drawing too thick of a line between the two, but I don't see how our proposal you know, much to Representative Zott's point, I don't see how our proposal is going to keep those folks in housing. And I'll go one step further and say, I don't even think that it's our jurisdiction to keep them in housing. Um, we've provided, we will provide for them and we'll get them the navigation services to stay in in the short term. But beyond that, I'm very concerned about that part of the budget. Okay, um, Representative Toronto. Yes, it was my understanding from your uh, first memo, uh, Mr. Chair, that um, services money uh, or clarification on the ability to use money for these services would come out of the second tier. Is that accurate to say? That's what I remember. Um, I, th I by putting the component services in the second tier, it's basically saying maybe in the next few weeks there will be a different interpretation or there will be an allowance of the use of this money right. that that from the that the treasury will say, oh, oh, okay, I get it. You know, it, uh, so that's that's why I, that's why I would have that's why I put it down in the second tier. Okay, that was my understanding as well. I just once again, I mean, I have to think in terms of uh, Caledonia County, which again, has a uh, disproportionate number of uh, homeless uh, families and children um, and uh, is without a shelter. And how uh, funds may come to this county. I mean, Memorial County does have a shelter, but uh, again, there's a, a substantial number of families there. And I just am unsure um, as of the reading of this and the, this discussion as to how assistance might come to the families, uh, the homeless families in counties uh, up here in the kingdom. I don't think that Gus, well, I, I, I'll ask Gus if he can tackle <laughs> that question a little bit, but also to, in, to, to answer or to address the services issue, because we talk about in affordable housing and specifically um, with respect to um, housing homeless families and ho homeless households. We, we talk about the three-legged stool yes. and that it's not separated out. But I just wanted to, it, Gus, I don't know if, 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 if you can address the concern that Representative Hango um, brought up about, about, well, who, quote unquote, who takes care of the, the services um, when it comes to housing? Well, I, I think that the representative is correct that we really need a partnership and we work at this at the community level between the service provider community whether that's a cap agency one of the designated agencies to take care of folks who are struggling with uh, mental health or have developmental disabilities um, parent child centers so their ability to be that service partner um, the homeless service agencies themselves, whether it's you know the Good Samaritan Haven, Samaritan House, um, Committee on Temporary Shelter. So the levels of support they get from the state of Vermont that they raise from community donations that they get from the philanthropic community are critical to the long-term success of these endeavors. Um, 
in some communities, we are confident that um, in the way that people are working together, that they will realign existing resources to make sure people are supported in housing uh, who need that. That's not true of the whole homeless population, but it's true of a portion of them. And I think the estimate has been about one third are gonna need some intensive ongoing support. Other people will need less intense support for a year to two years. And then other people simply with some financial assistance such as in the rental assistance packages are gonna be able to get back on their feet. Um, so there really is a variety of different need. Um, and I'm confident that in some parts of the state, uh, we will find resources or get organizations to reallocate resources to keep people housed. We may, without financial assistance for services, find other parts of the state say, we simply can't stand up a 20 to 40 unit facility and have to raise the money in our community for those services. And we're so we are waiting for, as all of you have been, uh, to see what the agency's plan will be going forward. Um, and I'm just hopeful that in the same way that Sarah Phillips and her crew rose to the occasion to get 2,000 people housed who did not have housing over the last three months, that they will be figuring this puzzle out. But it's a difficult one. Um, whether for some clients uh, they are, and these might be clients of the designated agencies uh, with significant enough conditions. You can, uh, they are Medicaid eligible and that can help cover the cost of services may be a part of the, how this all fits together. But, but it is a significant unknown and risk that we all collectively need to address. It was part of why our original proposal to you called for capitalizing a fund for reserves. And we have the similar concerns about the availability of rental assistance um, without which people, some people cannot be successful. There are people in the motels today who do actually have employment income. And again, if they can get their credit straightened out, they get some assistance from your rental assistance program that helps them get back into housing, they're gonna be fine. But there are other people with much more significant needs that will need to be addressed as we move forward. Jeffrey? I just wanted to thank you, Gus. I just wanted to reiterate what uh, uh, Gus was saying that uh, there, it's just it's worth remembering that uh, there's a range of supports that are available uh, to folks who might be experiencing homelessness and who might be in the motels or in shelter or somewhere else. That there are some folks who might need a light touch, who might need um, shorter duration supports. And there are other folks who might need housing retention services to keep them in, uh, get them adjusted to be in a permanent housing situation or help them develop additional skills. And then there are some folks who might need much more intensive services who are experiencing complex situations. And we're talking family supportive housing, permanent supportive housing. So to Gus's point, I think that there's, there is a range of, uh, when we talk about services, we should just remember that we're not talking about services. It's a whole gamut of uh, uh, different supports that we can offer to folks based on their situations, frankly. Thank you. Um, Representative Kalaki, then Hengo. Uh, thank you, Chair. There, there's two things you had asked us if we could look at Josh's uh, language, and I like it very much, I have to say, because it doesn't, it kind of, helps the agency pick the right um, organizations to regrant this money to without naming them. And I think that's gonna streamline the process. So I quite in favor of if the committee can look at that, to look at that. And then the, the second thing is um, the Vermont Legal Aid, when the thing that's on our website, there's an interesting part in there about the timing and that's, um, about reports due on October 10th, and then there's one in September. That's F and G on the second page of their thing. And I think that was what I was struggling with earlier is how do we give the agency enough flexibility to understand how to move these dollars and reallocate re them if necessary. So I think that language is, is pretty good guidance as well for the committee to consider. So those are the two things, Josh's language and then 
F and G from the Vermont Legal Aids uh, look interesting to add into our, our bill language to me. All right, thank you. Representative Hengo. Um, this question is for Gus. Can you talk about that um, capital reserve fund? I believe it's $14.4 million. Is that what you were referring to? Can you tell us what that can be used for? The, well, at this point, I think the conclusion is that we cannot do that, but it was for two things. And it was basically to capitalize a fund that would pay for rental assistance and services for a three to five year period. A different version of that might be to think about having an organization in the community buy an annuity uh, if that would pass muster. But there have been enough questions about that that that's why the chair has put it in tier two. Um, it is not unusual, as I said a few weeks ago, for us to capitalize funds at the beginning of a housing development. Um, what would be unusual here is the size of the capitalized fund. Um, so I know that's something that, that uh, your council has uh, thought about and considered. I think you know maybe on a one or two year level, it, he's beginning to think about whether or not that might be more doable, but, um, but it would be both for services of a, a variety of types that include clinical services and it would be for rental assistance. That was the, the purpose of that proposal. So thank you for that. And that is in the, the, the 25 million possible service components in tier two that was incorporated into that? I think that's where the, I think that's where the chair has put it, but I'm not, you'll have to ask him that question. That's the 15 million, the, okay. the 10 million, the 10 million right now is, um, is, relative surplus if it has you know where we've addressed um and that's the wrong word for it um but it's we've addressed a lot of the issues that have been brought to our table um we've we've we know that without the matching service components and everything else that there were limitations on what kind of capital expenditures we can make um and that so that 10 million dollars can be used I mean, if, if, if there's a project or if there's a way to use it, then we will. But also we've been asked to consider, you know, again, maybe this money goes to provide food for the people who are who are homeless, who have been experiencing homeless and are trying to get into a new place. And um, but that's something that we can consider it a bracketed thing or a draft thing right now. Um, before we go and put up Josh's language. Gus, did you have a follow-up? Well, this goes both to Josh's language and, and, and the tier one allocations. And I guess I would just say that um, I think Josh's language will be helpful in moving things along. Um, and similarly, I think having, thank you for having put us in your fast track bill and be named. I think it would be a little bit easier and a little faster for everyone if you're asking us to spend $9 million on the shelters with a little bit more breadth and flexibility uh, to name us there rather than have it have a have that money travel through the department to us and have them have to go through a process. Sure. Um, and that can go to the that extra two million dollars yeah. or that un that unknown two million dollars in capital as well. Um, but before before we look at the language, um, and when we do look at the language, I do want to bring in um, Maura Collins in a minute more um, about the about the notion of the, your agency dealing with the foreclosure portion of it in, in conjunction perhaps with the homeownership centers across the state. But I, I, Commissioner Hanford, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the enhanced VHIP program. Um, there are some questions about, um, I mean, as you know, we've dealt with this this program in its non-enhanced state, you know, for well over a year now. And, and so we pretty much, I think this committee has shown its support for for what we would be trying to do with, with this money. I, there is a question now about this idea of forgivable loans and granting. 
and also in potential uptake. I mean, I so I want you to go be able to like let us know. I, I mean, I've been using this example when I was on the board at Downstreet Housing. We we had when we opened a building in Barrie, we we needed to fill fifteen percent of those units with with um, homeless, formerly homeless people, people who were going to be formerly homeless if they got an apartment there, and we entertained 20 applications before we could find four folks to fulfill our 15%. Um, reiterating that this is a difficult population to house, even for nonprofit housing agencies that whose focus and whose mission is this. So my concern for the VHIP program right now is, is and, and, I, and, and I'd like to get some, some thoughts on your part about what you anticipate the uptake, the subscription to this, this money and to these renovations will be. And have you been able to refocus from them being forgivable loans to being straightforward grants? And how do you, how do you really envision that going? I, I guess not really envision, I don't, you know, but just to like, in the last few days, has anything become clearer about how you think this program might be functional at the level that you're proposing it at? Uh, sure. Good morning. Um, or I guess it's afternoon now. Um, <clears throat> the switch to forgivable loans and grants uh, to all grants is, is not a challenge in my view. I mean, we were already anticipating more than half being grants. Um, if they're all grants, we could in increase the size that go to commitments of, of housing homeless folks or um, the challenge of, of, of moving uh, homeless folks into these units is not much different in my mind um, than the, the, the new units, the acquisition and, and light rehab that VHCB and their partners are gonna have to experience um, on, on those units. We're gonna have to work with local partners that continue of care. You know, we can ensure that the affordability and the intent that they um, serve homeless folks is, is uh, capture that with a covenant on the property, you know, some sort of, um, you know, lien that they um, make that commitment to, to fill those units with, with families in need. Um, I think that's going to be a challenge for all the units that are either newly created or made available with these funds that matching up the long-term services and rental assistance is what we're all struggling with. But uh, the same resources will be available for these units as the other units out there. Um, many of the rehousing of homeless folks today are going into private properties, you know, every day, um, matching up rental assistance and those support and services. That's the, the go-to with many of these service providers because that's where there's available units. The, the network in the affordable housing community, there's virtually no vacancies. So... This is how it happens today. We're just trying to bring some more units online and make them available, you know, at a reasonable cost and um, you, you use partners to, to help us in that work. And, um, you know, not a problem in my mind at all to shift to all grants. So we were just trying to stretch the money and trying to build a even longer incentive by turning those um forgivable loans to stretch out a commitment of affordability, you know, for 10, 15 years by having it um, forgive a certain amount each year. But with a grant, we can still have a, um, a length of time that they have to remain affordable and a commitment to serve homeless people um, with support and services matched up and, you know, put restrictions on that property that if they um, aren't successful you know, those funds are redistributed somewhere else. We stagger the um, release of those funds. There's mechanisms we can employ um, to, to ensure accountability. So I don't know if that sort of hits the, what, what you were um, wondering, but it's, it's going to be with all of these funds, what I'm concerned about with seeing sort of the tier two, if we don't know for sure if we can use that money until later in the year, it's going to be hard to deliver on any of those items, you know, whether it be the rental registry build out or other capital expenses that we don't get the go ahead to, 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 to go forward until the fall and leaving little time to be successful. 
that that's of concern. Um, you know, the VHIP investment amount, um, I, I'm um, okay with it being scalable. Like if we want to trim back and reduce the number of units, you know, we were talking 250 units with $8 million. Some of the other commitments for capital out there ha have been less, you know, units and you haven't had as many uh, prescriptions around how many you want to get or the or the length of affordability commitment, if we can have some of that same flexibility and um, have a, a, a slightly less to work with, I think we'll be successful. There's been surveys of landlords done um, that represent about 4,000 units out there. And um, there was about 1,300 that would take up a program like this from an initial survey um, that was put out, you know, if you were provided, you know, a, a grant or a resource of this level, would you make it available? Could you get the work done by December 31st? And um, out of those 4,000 units surveyed, there was over a thousand that were um, willing to take this up and had no problem, would even commit to uh, very low rental rents, you know, below what you would, would typically see as a typical affordable rent in order to get their units um, back online and, and out there and available. But I'm not gonna um, suggest like everyone has said this, that the ongoing commitments for support and services is going to be the challenge with this program, just like the other capital um, we've put out there. It's different for the shelters, you know, when we're putting money into expand shelters, uh, maybe open up new ones, um, th that those same challenges aren't, aren't quite the same there but we're not really solving um the real needs for for this homeless population by just adding shelter capacity so we're all on the same boat with that challenge yep. so so when you talk about all the covenants and all the all the all the strings that might be attached or all the you know the bars that someone would have to reach you know you're you're reporting that you're reporting that um, a substantial number of people have said yes, even with those in place, that they would they would submit to those in order to get apartments online that would, in, you know, for for their for their purposes would improve their properties and for the society's purpose would provide an apartment for people to 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 not be homeless in. Um, right. So so. This gets to the question, and, and you came on a little bit later where we were perseverating a little bit over the, how, how deep do we need to write this legislation, you know, or are you going to be cutting and pasting and lifting from existing programs these covenants that, that are satisfactory to the committee that says, well, we do want, we don't want this to be perceived as free money. You know, because there's a lot of work that has to be done. It's not free money. It's a lot of work to take on uh, a, a homeless family. It's uh, it's a it's a lot of work to have someone come into your house that that may you know that. But but if you're if you're making the commitment to bring it forward so that it's habitable, you know, here is a grant that's going to do that. So, mm -hmm. you know, do we do we rely on the Department of Housing and Community Development to set up these to set up these um, uh, uh, this contract, if you will, that's going to make sure that there's a real balance there, that people will take it and not feel like they're overly stringed, because right. we hear that a lot. Um, you know, it's more trouble than it's worth. Um, we don't want to make it more trouble than it's worth. Right. You know, first I'll say, you know, we have systems in place to, to, to develop these covenants and put every CDBG grant and the path through that those go to has a minimum five year covenant and change of use um, provision. Um, so this is pretty standard. Um, you know, we would uh, put that for affordability period, regardless if the homeless um, tenancy didn't work out after an initial period, they would still have to have an affordability a component to it that would be lasting. Um, what we heard from the surveys response that, that I've seen um, is that many of these landlords are saying, this unit is vacant, it's in need of repair, I'm still paying property taxes on it. If I could collect half of the standard rent, but have a grant pay to fix it up and make it available, I'm in, sign me up tomorrow. I mean, they're sitting on property that they're paying property tax on, 
no rents coming in. And there's, you know, dozens of them in some of these portfolios, you know, $400 a month is better than nothing when they're putting out, you know, near that much in property taxes each year. It just, the, the, the model for privately owned affordable rents in tight markets is broken. You know, there's no value in reinvesting in the property. They, they can't raise the rents. The property taxes go up and the tenant, and there's still challenges with, with um, rent collection and tenant issues. So in many cases, without any support, we know from the affordable housing work we do, we have to provide some capital to make any housing affordable to folks that are low income. We're just not putting it towards this segment of the market in any meaningful way. And there's thousands of units out there that could serve this need with some investment. And, um, you know, it's, if $30,000 is, you know, we, we think that that's what it takes to bring a unit um, and rehab it uh, to help safety standards, bring some weatherization. Um, and that that's a pretty fair bargain. If you think you're going to get five year, if we're going to require five years of affordability out of it, do the math on the rent that that's a pretty, um, pretty good uh, sort of return for that many years of affordability based on the investment per unit. Um, you know, so, knowing that there are, you know, even in, even in projects that we fund um, and great work that we all participate in, with the affordable housing, we have to reinvest in those properties every so often. It's not a one time and we're done. So we're constantly reinvesting in our, in our network of, of affordable housing. And that, you know, for that price per unit for five years at a minimum, that's a pretty good bargain. It, it, I'm not going to say it won't be a challenge to get this done in five months, um, but we're going to try as hard as we can, like everyone else, and line up as much as we can in advance and give signals, if we can, to the folks that have indicated they want to do this work, that to start lining up, this is looking like it's going to happen, be prepared, um, and, you know, remove as many of the strings that have gotten in the way of this, these programs when they're funded with um, very limited federal funds, you know, a $7,000 grant that has to be matched three to one with their own private funding. Those don't move very fast when you still have to have a environmental review and historic preservation inspection. And, you know, um, this would be a very different emergency rehab um, effort to be successful. So two quick questions um, for a move on to Mora. So, so would you be able to in the, in over the next, X number. I mean, we're 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 aiming to be finished here by June twentieth. You know, we're going to pass a bill on COVID recovery before then. Um, again, I'm and and the committee can weigh in on this if they like. I am. What I'm concerned on in terms of the language of a contract that you have with an individual landlord is that we know what you're what you're asking them to do. Because if, 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 in fact, all of these things that you've just mentioned are part of their contract with you in order to receive the grant, those are all things that I don't, you know, we don't have the time to spend writing that into statute, nor do you really want us to, because you're dealing with, you're dealing with rules that you've worked with before. So we I'm already have a model. I mean, we've already, we do these with the homeownership centers, Naval Works of Western Vermont, that has the five-year covenant language, that has all this stuff. And so if, if, you could share, if, if you could share samples of that so that we know that, that, that this is what it's going to be, then we're not reinventing the wheel on your back. You know, we don't want you to be doing the extra work. But if you could share with us examples of, of the contracts that you already work with, understanding right up front that it's not going to be the contract that you're going to be working with in, a, right. in an enhanced VHIP program. Also, what I heard is that you would prefer to see more money up front for the enhanced VHIP program. Um, so, I mean, I've broken down, I've made this proposal to the committee and to everybody, and, and it's it's just a draft. But if I were to if I were to suggest, or if someone in the committee were to suggest that we put more money into the VHIP program up front, um, then 
where would I balance my where would I balance my thing? Do you think the foreclosure program, because of the nature of of one of the things that we chatted about a little bit earlier, was that well, because of the nature that the pe- the low income people that you that you were illustrating last week, who might be um, the low income ownership people, who might be the prime candidates for foreclosure assistance, um, may not know that they're going to be going under foreclosure until August. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so is it possible to, you know, in your mind to adjust that program? So perhaps there's, there's, you know, if we shift another million dollars or another whatever number to the VHIP program, that there's, um, you know, that the balance here that we're, that we're estimating is that there won't be a real rush on foreclosure money until perhaps later this summer. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess what I would say in general, all the tier two elements. I hadn't seen this sort of reworking and the additional detail until I logged on here. I guess what I would say is for the tier two, if it's a continuation of an existing program that you funded in tier one, it's just adding more money. That's easier to accommodate because we know it's successful. We can keep it going shifting. But if tier two is contemplating anything that we need to stand up fresh right from the beginning without knowing we can spend the money and it's possibly not going to be approved until later, I don't think there's much chance those things are going to be successful. So that's just a big picture way of saying, if you want to break up the rental rehab money into two tranches um, so we can get started and if it's moving, we can access the second, fine. But if it's contemplating down here, any new programs that would need to wait for that tier two approval at a later date, we're probably going to be so in the thick of it that it's just, it's, it won't be time to successfully launch a new program. Well, the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head is the, um, is the rental registry. Um, the other programs are continuations, or at least in this proposal. So, Right. And um, the rental registry being an IT you know, project with the state, that's the type of element that in order to have any chance that it's successful, being, I don't know what the rules are on that project like that with the corona relief money that it has to be up and running or it just has to be paid for by the December. But you know that needs every day available to us to, to be up and running uh, by December 31st um, with, with uh, some major IT projects that ADS has already been committed to on the hook yeah. as of today. So that, that's, a, that's yeah. a concern of mine. Okay. No, thank you. This is very, that was very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, Maura, are you still with us? Um, how are you? I am. So I asked Maura, I asked um, Maura to come on because one of the, the conversations that we've had and some of the language that Josh shared with us in terms of, in terms of um, specific things is this foreclosure program that was um, just brought forward really in greater detail just this past week. And um, as we had with the rental assistance program and the, and the proposal from legal aid and, and uh, to, to help facilitate and provide legal services to people who are, who be utilizing that program. um, It's clear that it, it can be clear that, Vermont Housing Finance Agency is, uh, is it agency or authority? I'm sorry. Um, agency. Agency is, um, as a state agency is, um, has the connections and has the experience in dealing with foreclosure proceedings. And um, so more, I just wanted to get your thoughts on your agency's feelings about having the language that's been proposed to have, you know, to essentially, um, grant you the authority to set up this, this foreclosure program, um, perhaps by yourself or with the homeownership centers across the state, uh, and just share your thoughts on it. It's been pretty new to us in terms of it actually being on the table. Yeah, for the record, I'm Maura Collins. I'm the director of Vermont Housing Finance Agency, VHFA. And, um, Yes, at one point this was, um, I believe I've heard Josh say this was going to be proposed as a part of the administration's phase two request and then because of some of the issues you all have identified and and have been spoken about, it made sense to group it in with the rental assistance requests and that reasoning is that um, we are not all exactly clear what the future holds, that may surprise you, 
And uh, we think that having some kind of flexibility in being able to um, address the needs of Vermonters, whether they be in rental assistance through VHIP or through the um, mortgage assistance or foreclosure prevention would be really beneficial. And so um, it made sense to put the foreclosure piece in now along with the rental uh, assistance so that if um, there is tremendous demand for rental assistance and really no um, eligible need for um, the foreclosure prevention, then instead of losing those dollars um, to housing and to this assistance, it could shift a little bit. And you all have talked about when should that shift happen? What should be the triggers? What reporting at what times? Um, and so that's why this was a late addition, but um, thankfully, due to the strong network that exists in this state, it's not gonna be a hard, um, it's not gonna be an impossible program to stand up quickly. And some of the things that we have going for us in the state are that uh, VHFA as the proposed administrator is a statewide quasi, um, quasi public agency. So the same as VHCB and a lot like the Vermont State Housing Authority, um, we are in those ways um, used to running state programs like you're, you are familiar with the state housing tax credit program that we've been administering since 2000. Um, and so we have the ability and relationship with the state to play this role and being a statewide lender, um, we know that we can meet the needs of the regions of the state equally um, as opposed to divvying up money by county or city or something like that. And then you may have um, uh, uneven availability of funds based on that kind of model. So VHFA has been a mortgage lender since the mid seventies. We have our own portfolio of mortgages that I don't talk to you all a lot about because uh, the state is not a part of that program. But um, we have mortgages um, that get serviced. We sadly have do need to foreclose on people sometimes and work with servicers who service our loans and eventually um, sometimes foreclose on loans and we're used to that entire process. And so administering a program like this um, for the state so that we'd be working with all the state servicers makes a lot of sense because we have a lot of those existing relationships. So if you can imagine that your constituents have mortgages that may be serviced by any number of local banks, credit unions, maybe national servicers, um, they would, uh, the homeowner and or servicer would, would apply to VHFA for assistance to get, right now it's written up as about three months of principal and interest payments um, provided. And we would work with the servicer of that loan to understand the situation of that borrower and what's needed um, deem them eligible for the program, looking at the CARES Act, making sure that we're in compliance with the limitations of using CRF money, and um, then uh, look to make those awards and track all this information on a regular basis. Um, I agree with Representative Kalaki that weekly sounds like a lot, but we could do it. Um, and uh, more meaningfully come back to you all or whoever you deem to, um, to have these conversations about what has been the experience once the program um, opened up and, and what's the usage. We'd need to stand up some um, marketing and advertising and, and public awareness so that people knew that this program was available. Uh, we would need to stand up a call center so that um, people who, you can put all the information on the internet you want, but as we know from the unemployment um, experience, sometimes people just want to get someone on the phone to answer their questions. So um, we would have, we're looking to have uh, that available. Uh, we are talking with um, the legal services of Vermont, I'm not using, I always call it law line, I know it's not called that anymore, but whatever legal aids um, call center is to maybe think about um, having them help with that program. Uh, 
work with legal aid so that they get some money um, to help represent the consumers who may um, not be appropriately served by their loan servicer. There may be, especially I think, out-of-state servicers who are not familiar with Vermont's program, aren't paying attention. They may tell their customer um, that they're not eligible or, you know, I don't know anything about this program. I'm not going to work with this VHFA because you don't have a VHFA loan. And um, uh, legal aid would help represent those uh, consumers to make sure that they advocate to get what they deserve. Um, and then we would look to work with the state's homeownership centers to provide the kind of uh, financial counseling that they have long been doing um, to support borrowers, um, whether they get this assistance or not. But this is a way to work with um, borrowers. Maybe, maybe there's not going to be enough money to go around. Maybe some people are going to get forbearance and not get financial assistance to help pay down that forbearance. And having that link through the homeownership centers, that, that gets us a foot in the door with that borrower so that we can then help them uh, be successful long term. So before I stop talking, open up to questions, I just want to... Um, clarify that uh, even though I started by explaining VHFA's experience being a mortgage lender, this is not a program for VHFA loans. And that is going to be a, a point that we're going to have to um, really clarify, just like the state housing authority is going to have to really clarify that the rental assistance program is not just for voucher holders. Um, this would not be a VHFA program in the sense that it's only for VHFA borrowers, but this would be available to all eligible uh, mortgage holders who have had a COVID crisis, and David Hall can then channel his voice here of saying, you know, those thresholds of COVID crisis between March and December, all the money has to be spent by the end of December, um, and the other CRF limitations that are in the CARES Act. Um, so we're happy to stand up and serve the state in this role. We feel like this is why you have agencies like VHFA to turn to in times of crisis. And uh, I think we can really work with our homeownership centers and legal aid and DHCD to um, put forward a, a quality program in a short amount of time. Okay, Representative Clackey. Thank you. Um, Mara, you know, in the stripped down bill that we're currently looking at, it doesn't designate your agency. It doesn't designate the other agencies we're talking about either. And it, and when you talk about, well, this is in the plan, but that's your plan. And we would have to, if we, if it's as written, the, um, the agency, the Department of Housing and Community Development would have this money and then they would perhaps designate your agency to do this, but they could determine a different plan than when you're talking about. So are you comfortable that your agency is not named in this bill that as we move forward? You know, I, I'd like for our agency to be named in this bill. So, um, so that uh, the program, as I just testified to you, uh, happens. Um, and at the same time, I don't, the only thing is, it's really a question for the lawyers of which I'm always clear I'm not one. I don't wanna lose that flexibility and ability for the state to be able to shift resources as needed. So yes, I would like for it to say DHCD will work with VHFA to run this program. What I don't want um, to happen is for then um, again, what if there's not $5 million of assistance, which I think there will be, but what if there's not, I don't want there to be even a dollar that doesn't get spent where it's needed on housing because I think the needs are so great. So that would be my only caveat, but yes, um, okay. naming our agency. And at the same time, I want to say, I do have trust and faith. Josh and I have been on the phone, what, at least three times a week, Josh, um, talking continually about this. The state is a wonderful partner to VHFA. And so I do believe that whatever gets stood up will be okay. Uh, Josh serves on my board and I serve on his community development advisory group and other things. So um, this is why Vermont, I can already tell, is going to be able to um, spend these dollars in an efficient, strong way that helps Vermonters because of the partnerships that we have 
between all the players. Okay. Now, in in the proposal from Vermont Legal Aid, they put a time of September first that the agency gets to recalibrate if necessary to give us time. Does that seem appropriate to you as we try to set all this up and get it out in the field and then still have this flexibility that we need to reallocate instead of the last two weeks of the year? Yes. Um, I like that. I, I didn't know about the December 20th date before I was listening to you. And that seems awfully late um, to me for what I'm talking about. Um, and so September 1st, I think we could all make an argument for why the first of every month could work. So um, that works for me. I'm, I'm working on the design of the program in June, hoping to launch as early in July as you all let me. And um, so that would mean two months of work. And so you'll get two months worth of answers. Um, I don't want to I mean, you know that it takes a while to stand up a new program, just spreading the word takes a month and then getting all the paperwork from the servicers. Uh, this right. is new. So yes, checking in by the first makes sense. But if it's, I have to spend all the money by the first, September 1st, then no, the program will not be done by then. But I know you yes. know that. So I'm not worried in that way. Uh, that That's not what I, that's not how I read that. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um. And I want to be mindful of the time. Um, we've been on Zoom for a little while um, this morning, this afternoon, and um, we're going to be back in a little bit. So I just wanted to um, thank everybody who's here right now. So the homework for tonight for, for the committee. Um, what we did not get to is a specifically looking at the information. This should be posted now. So, um, so the homework for tonight is basically um, to take a look at what Josh had proposed uh, for the language that he shared with us uh, in terms of how how language can be shaped to virtually name uh, an organization. Uh, I would also like us to keep in mind um, the, the financial breakdowns that we have proposed versus what we've heard today. Um, and and to read the uh, V the VLA proposal, which is actually titled ACCD, um, Representative Hango pointed that out. It's it's titled the ACCD memo um, about ex it was provided by uh, by Vermont Legal Aid. So on on the rental portions of this, so the decisions we have to make tomorrow morning in finishing this conversation is. Um, are going to center around how prescriptive we want the language. Do we want to drop in language that talks, you know, as 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 deep as what has been proposed, or do we want to leave it at um, simply that the uh, department, if that is if that's the direction we're going in in terms of giving the money to upfront, that the department then negotiates with those other organizations in order to provide those services in their in this way. Um, Anything that we're passing, again, just like S-333, is session law. So it is not permanent statute. It's only dealing with this particular crisis. So any program we stand up, um, and, I, and I, I'm sorry, I will take that back because if we do pass a bill that has the language for the rental registry, that will affect statute. That is the one element that would, that would continue on. But all of these programs to get money out to people and to help them through the crisis, um, our, our session law. Uh, I'm going to ask David to kind of, I'll talk to David a little bit later this afternoon, and I'm going to ask him to put together kind of a, a, a big bill that has a lot of this stuff that we're talking about. And then when we review it tomorrow, we can say, yes, that's good. No, we don't need that. Yes, we need that. Rather than try to get him to try to add it in at the last minute, I'm going to ask him to try to create a bigger bill. Um, that addresses quite a bit of what we talked about today. Um, if that's sufficient, Matt, you um, represent Byron. Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually had kind of an involved question around the maybe involved question for uh, Commissioner Hanford about the uh, VHIP program. If we're tight on time, I have no problem emailing him and trying to get answers. Yeah, if you could do that and just CC me and or you know whatever you want to do. Um, or unless it's specific to something that you can relate to us later. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that would be that would be great. But okay. um, 
I'm about to chew my arm off. I haven't, it's, it's been a long morning. Um, so I think that's it. Does everybody, has everybody had their homework? Um, and we will um, meet again tomorrow morning at 8.30 um, is the scheduled time for us. So um, we'll see you over coffee and toast. Um, I ate my homework. What's that? Dog ate my homework. Yeah, well, I, there's so much to go in that direction with homework.